We are rapidly approaching the next flight of SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket. Since it's been so long since its last flight, how is the company preparing to return the world's most powerful rocket to flight? All that and more in this week's Kennedy Space Center flyover. But first, thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Before we dive into Falcon Heavy, let's check in on SpaceX's main facility and future Starship factory at the Kennedy Space Center, Roberts Road. Now in this week's flyover, three Starship launch tower segments have been spotted under construction, and columns for future sections are present. Of these three sections built, the southernmost one was the first one built and features the resting location of the chopsticks, indicating this will be the lowest section of the tower. This also proves that the tower is for Starship, but we just don't yet know where it's going to go. The first section is also starting to get beams for what will be the first floor of the tower. We can also see that the rails for the chopsticks have been painted black, so maybe this one will eventually be black and white like the fixed service structure at 39A. Would be some pretty nice aesthetics. Also, the tent area south of the tower segments has received some new insulated pipes, probably for these new tower sections. However, the mega bay at the site hasn't seen much progress in the last few weeks. We can see more beams being staged there and hardware being installed on the auxiliary foundations. On these foundations, it's expected they'll prefabricate large sections of the building before stacking them on the structure. A similar process took place while building the mega bay at Boca Chica. Looking to the west of the site, the Star Factory building is continuing its southward expansion. This building will someday assemble Starship ring sections, nose cones, tank domes, and more. And just next door to the new factory, the chopstick structure looks to be completed with the actuators already installed, but teams are still working on the rails. The carriage system for the chopsticks, which will move them up and down the tower, has gained one of the arms that will connect the assembly to the tower. The ship QD arm is in the process of having its cryogenic piping installed, which will help load or unload propellants from a stacked starship. Booster 1060-14 was also spotted at the entrance of Hangar X. It was removed from Port Canaveral earlier in that day, and was spotted being unloaded ahead of its refurbishment. Its next flight is still to be determined. Now let's pivot to LC-39A and see what preparations are taking place for the 4th Falcon Heavy mission as well as progress on the starship pad. The deluge system for the Starship Orbital Launch Mount has already been installed. This will spray water underneath the Raptor engines of a Super Heavy booster, dampening their vibrations and protecting pad hardware. Also, three of the newer GSE tanks near the new Large LOX tank have been removed and transported to the Turning Basin for unknown reasons. However, progress continues to be made on connecting the newly renovated methane tank farm to the tower. And just next to the big methane sphere, the likely new water tank is now being painted black, in line with SpaceX's aesthetics. Some new tank farm development is also occurring to the west of the main ramp, with a new tank being installed there and space being made for another one. These could be for additional liquid nitrogen storage. Also, a new building, likely another cryogenics bunker, is being built right next door to it. Now, let's turn our attention to 39A proper and the Falcon Transporter Erector. The reaction frame can be seen visibly modified to support Falcon Heavy. This transition from supporting Falcon 9 to Falcon Heavy required several changes. This included the removal of the east and west hold downs used on Falcon 9. These can be seen sitting on the pad in our flyover pictures, as well as on Harry's satellite photo. These are now located to the northeast, right next to the reaction frame. SpaceX also had to add the two south side booster hold downs that were missing during the Crew 5 launch. The quick disconnect umbilicals for the side boosters also had to be reinstalled. There are two QDs per booster. One mainly supplies liquid oxygen, and the other mainly supplies RP-1. Also, all connections from the ground systems to these QDs had to be restored, which hadn't been in use for some time. This involved cleaning, testing, and certification of these connections that hadn't been in use since June of 2019. We saw some of this testing the other day with the T-TEB lines. No reason to panic, the fire is actually normal. The so-called compression bridges on the reaction frame also had to be reinstalled. These help take and balance the weight of the side boosters, residing in between them and the center core. They can be seen here, and here from the underside. Look in the regions in between each of the three cores. While most of the modifications are on the reaction frame, the strongback itself also needed some tweaking. It last supported a Crew Dragon mission, 
so the top insert on the strong deck needed to be changed from a crew dragon version to a fairing version. Additionally, the strong back needed the addition of purge lines for the falcon heavy side cores. These prevent gaseous oxygen from building up inside them, and a similar umbilical is also present for falcon 9 and the center core of falcon heavy. After all these modifications were complete, we saw some testing of the strong back. This included raising it, connecting it to the reaction frame, and then performing retraction tests as if it were a launch. For the USSF-44 mission, Falcon Heavy will carry two large classified payloads for the United States Space Force, along with several rideshare payloads, to a geostationary orbit. This flight will feature the famed dual RTLS, where both side boosters will return to land at landing zones 1 and 2 at Cape Canaveral. The center core, on the other hand, will be expended. Now, peeking over at SpaceX's other Falcon 9 launch site, Slick 40, we can see the transporter erector is not on the pad. It's currently still in the horizontal integration facility with booster 1062-10, getting ready for the launch of Starlink Group 4-36. And at Port Canaveral, we see SpaceX's two Dragon recovery ships, Shannon and Megan. Megan recently returned from recovering Crew Force capsule off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida, while Shannon had returned from Tampa. Shannon was on call in case a backup recovery zone was required, but that wasn't needed on this flight. Heading down to Blue Origin's Exploration Park campus, there is definitely a lot of movement going on. I mean, just look at the parking lots overflowing. Does anyone want to count all those cars for us? <coughs> the first thing to look at here is the wrapped dome outside of the main New Glen manufacturing building, which appears to be about the right size for New Glen's 7 meter diameter. While we have seen domes like this outside before, this one is new since our last flyover. There is no sign of any of the hardware that we saw offloaded at the Turning Basin last week, which included two fairing halves and other related hardware that went through vacuum chamber testing at NASA's Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio. Let's also check in on the 2CAT facility, which stands for Second Stage Cleaning and Testing Facility, where New Glenn's second stages will be, well, you guessed it, cleaned and tested. Work is underway right now to pave a proper road to it from near the TCAT, the tank cleaning and testing facility for New Glenn's first stages. TUCAT appears to be undergoing its final exterior preparations ahead of use. It's come so far since our first flyover back in mid-February. At the southern end of Blue's campus, the warehouse expansion is still progressing well, with the structure continuing to rise and pre-assembled segments laying on the ground ready to go. Just to the west of the existing warehouse, we can see new foundations being prepared. These are most likely to support the new vertical assembly area that was depicted in recent plans. We're not quite sure what this area will look like, or what it will be used for, but it will definitely be one of the things to keep an eye on over the coming weeks and months. And just to the south of these new foundations, we can even see the ground being prepared for the Reef Pathfinder building, which was also shown in those recent plans. Hopping over to Blue Origin's Launch Complex 36, there's still activity just in front of the main horizontal integration facility, where a large piece of hardware is being assembled. Just behind that, we can just see the frame for a tent going up, where a concrete slab was recently poured for a GSC storage building. Meanwhile, to the north at Relativity's Launch Complex 16, preparations leading up to Terran-1's maiden flight continue. Last week, Relativity's CEO Tim Ellis tweeted out that, Work continues in a hangar at Cape Launch Site for final vehicle integration ahead of Terran 1's static fire and launch. Coming along well, swapping to hydraulic release launch mount. FAA license process progressing. In our photos, we can see the transporter erector system out at the launch pad. This most likely means that it's being integrated with the hydraulic release launch mount that Tim mentioned. Hopefully we'll see a fully stacked Terran 1 out at the pad for our next flyover. And speaking of Terran 1, be sure to check out our methane rocket race video, where we discuss which liquid methane fueled rocket might be the first to launch. During our flyover, Julia, Stephen, and Thomas also got an amazing treat with a NASA T-38 flying beneath the helicopter, which allowed them to capture some awesome shots. At the launch and landing facility, we were also treated to another special guest, the NASA Super Guppy. This iconic aircraft was delivering the heat shield for the Orion spacecraft that will fly on the Artemis 3 mission to return humans to the surface of the moon. At ULA's Space Launch Complex 41, Vulcan's mobile launcher platform can be seen at the pad. 
this rolled out recently, likely for testing ahead of integrating the first Vulcan vehicle. Work is also taking place on the Delta IV mobile service tower at Space Launch Complex 37, which seems to be including some painting. And finally, let's look at Pad 39B. It's currently empty, but not for too much longer. Artemis 1 is set to roll back out to the pad, hopefully for launch, no earlier than November 4th. If you want to prepare for this historic mission, hop on over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com and pick up one of our metal prints of SLS. It will look great on your wall. Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is the best online learning platform which helps you learn dozens of topics interactively. Not only is this the easiest way for me to pick up a subject personally, it's even been proven as the best method to learn new topics. Each of their courses features small puzzles and hands-on diagrams to help you grasp the concepts of the course. We talked a lot about launch towers and hardware in this video, which relies on a large amount of structural engineering. If you want to learn more about how structures work and the methods involved in designing them, check out Brilliant's course Structures, which helps you understand the terminology and methodology behind structure. You can check out Brilliant for free today at brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight, and the first 200 viewers to use that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your week.